Welcome to another Zeek in Action. I'm your host, Richard Baitlick. And in today's video, I'm going to share one way to install Zeek from scratch. The idea behind this video is to try to make it as clean and direct as possible for someone who would like to start using Zeek, but has not tried installing it yet. Uh, in previous videos, I have shown how to generate Zeek data using an application like Brim, which is available for Windows and Linux and Mac. And it works by ingesting a captured network traffic file in PCAP format and then generating Zeek logs. Uh, but what I'd like to do in this video is to show you how to install Zeek from package format as provided by the Zeek project and show how that can be done and to use it either to process live traffic or to look at traffic in a PCAP file. So with that, let's get started. Now I said I was going to try to show you all the steps involved with this. So that's what we're going to do uh, with the exception of downloading a file. Other than that, we're going to do everything. So if you, I'm using Windows 10 here. Uh, if you're actually working on a Linux system, it's probably a lot easier to do this. But what I'm going to do is show you how using a Linux system and a virtual box, you can create a virtual machine that you can then experiment with using Zeek. Um, just as a side note, I am a big fan of the Chocolatey Package Manager. It basically makes it as easy to install packages on Windows as you would find in uh, a Linux or, or a BSD distribution. So I really enjoy it. I, I use it to install as much software as possible when I'm using Windows. Uh, to that end, I have installed VirtualBox already using uh, the Chocolate Package Manager. I have also installed 7-Zip because we're going to need that to uh, extract uh, the virtual machine we'll be using. Okay, so let's assume that you have VirtualBox already installed. I'm not going to go through that. It's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, where do you get a virtual machine or a hard drive for a virtual machine? Now, you could download the uh, an ISO from the Debian project and uh, install it that way. I decided to cut out a couple of those steps because this is just for demonstration purposes. It's not for production. So what I did was I went to the osboxes.org website and uh, went to the Debian section of it. And I am going to be working with a VirtualBox desktop image. I'm going to be using the server image and the 64-bit server image. So this will download a uh, VDI for me. And I'm using the server image because I don't need any graphical interface here. And uh, it's, as you can see, it's much smaller, 378 megabytes. Now, I already downloaded that. When you download that file, it comes uh, in this rather um, uh, boring name of 64-bit.7z, uh, meaning that uh, it's been encoded in 7-zip format. So we need first to extract that. So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to say 7-zip, open the archive, and there it is. And I'm going to extract it. And I'm going to extract it into this VM uh, directory that I've previously created. I just named it using the date of, of today's recording, 2021-0930A. You can call it whatever you want. I just do that to try to keep things easier or clean when I'm uh, doing a bunch of tests. So I'm going to say OK. And now it's extracting this uh, VDI image. Now, this VDI image is is a hard drive that is available for use in VirtualBox. It's not an actual VirtualBox uh, complete virtual machine by itself, but I'll show you how to use it. So we're going to do that right now. So once we're done with that, if we take a look in our VM directory, you'll see here we have this Debian 11 server VDI waiting for us, virtual disk image. So I'm going to uh, begin using VirtualBox now, and I'm going to create a new virtual machine. And I'm going to call it Debian 11 for Zeek. <coughs> and that's fine. I'll keep it in my users Richard VirtualBox VMs directory. It is a Linux VM, and it's a Debian 64-bit, which is exactly what I'm going to be using today. 
I'm going to give it uh, 4 gigs of RAM. Kind of arbitrary, but this box has plenty of RAM, so I'll give 400, uh, 4096 megabytes, which is 4 gigs. And I'm going to use an existing virtual hard disk file. So I need to show where to find that thing. So I'm going to say add. And my downloads, VM. There it is. So now it has that VDI image that I'm going to be using. I'm going to say create. So now I have this virtual machine. Uh, one of the changes I'm going to make is to the uh, network. I'm going to not NAT it, I'm going to bridge it. That way it'll get an IP address that's um, assigned to my regular network. This is a personal preference, you can do it any way you want. But what you're, what you're going to find is as I go through this process, I'm going to be, uh, as soon as I can, I'm going to secure shell into this system uh, from this laptop that I'm using. I don't like to just sit there and work through the interface of the uh, virtual machine itself. As soon as I can, I'm going to get out of that. All right, so it's attaching to my wireless NIC. Hit OK. Now, if you were using Zeek in production, you would have one IP address or one physical NIC, or I guess in some cases it would be a virtual NIC, and you would use that for uh, interacting with the system itself. Then you would have two or more interfaces after that, which would be used strictly for monitoring. They wouldn't have an IP address. They would, uh, they would not ARP. They would just simply listen to network traffic. We're not going to do that here today because I'm just trying to show you a demonstration. In fact, my model for this type of demonstration would be like using Wireshark. If you were to go to wireshark.org and you download the EXE or the MSI to install Wireshark, and you want to double click, and you will, suddenly you're going to start sniffing traffic, you're going to be sniffing traffic against the built-in interface in your laptop, which would be probably a Wi-Fi interface, and it would be watching traffic on your Wi-Fi network. Uh, I'm essentially going to be doing something like that here today, except I'm doing it with the virtual machine, and I'm doing it uh, inside this Debian system. So that's why we're just going to leave this one interface. Uh, we are going to bridge it so it can communicate with the outside world. Again, it's personal preference. Nat could do the same thing. Um, but I'm also going to be sniffing on that interface. So we're going to have to keep that in mind as we, we go forward. All right, so we should be ready to go. Uh, one of the other things I'm going to do before we start here is I am going to, uh, let's see here. Actually, I think that should be good. All right. All right, here we are. We're booting our virtual machine. I'm just going to make sure that it boots and works properly, and then I'm going to exit. So we're going to do that quickly here. Might be able to scale this a little bit. I guess that didn't do that. That's one of the reasons why I like to get out of these virtual machines as quickly as possible. Okay, so let's just quickly log in. The login for these is osboxes is the username, and the password is osboxes.org. And I'm going to just check what my IP address is, and I'm assigned 192.168.4.182. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to install an OpenSSH server so I can connect to this thing remotely. So I'm going to type sudo apt install openssh-server. Put in my password. All right, so now I should be able to connect to this thing remotely. Start a local terminal. Again, username is OS boxes and my IP address one eighty two. Don't want 
I'll save the password. Okay, so now I am I am logged into that system. All right, so now I'm going to power it off. Okay, so that box is now powered down. And what I'm going to do now is take a snapshot of this system so that if I make changes down the line and I want to revert back to where I am right now, I can do that. So we'll say take a snapshot. I'm going to call this uh, in the description after first boot and installing open SSH. So now I have a snapshot. Now I'm going to start the system again. And as soon as it boots, I am going to log into it via SSH. That is the wrong IP address. Oh, wait a second. Let's look. That is the right IP address. No, I do not want to save the password. Okay. So here I am. I am on my Debian system, and I want to install Zeek. How am I going to do that? Let's go back to the Zeek homepage and figure that out. So we get to Zeek.org and we click on Get Zeek and see where it takes us. So now we have a choice here between the Zeek long-term support, the 4.0.4 release, or the current development release, which is 4.1.1. I'm going to choose 4.1.1 and I'm going to click here on the downloads that say uh, binaries. When I do that, I come to what probably is a slightly confusing page if you're just looking for some sort of download. Um, basically, what we have here is a bunch of description about what is involved with these various packages because there's six that you could choose from. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download packages for the latest feature release build. So that would be Zeek 4.1.1. And when I click on that, it takes me to another site which is uh, hosted by the OpenSUSE project. And again, this could be a little confusing, which is why I'm going through this. Um, now I'm going to select my operating system. I'm running Debian. And again, a choice to make. Uh, do I grab the binary package directly from uh, the, the OpenSUSE site, or do I add the repository and install manually? I'm going to add the repository and install manually, because that way I will have the uh, correct um, method of installation available the next time I want to do this on the system. So I'm going to do that. Now I have to dis I have to recognize uh, which version of Debian I'm running. Again, I'm running Debian 11. So I'm finally to the point where I can uh, grab something and install it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight each of these in turn, and I'm going to paste them into my window. This is one of the reasons why I like using uh, uh, remote connection via SSH. So that's the first step. Next step. Oh, I just realized. While Echo is uh, installed, and so is sudo and t, uh, both curl and uh, a program like TCP dump are not installed in Debian by default. So I'm going to install those first before I take any further steps. So I'm going to go ahead and install curl. And I'm going to do the same for TCP dump. And I'll tell you why I'm installing TCP dump in a second. Okay, 
So I have curl and TCP dump installed. Well, let's go back to our commands here. So here's what we need to install via curl. This is going to grab the release key and some other stuff we need to um, install. This basically makes it so that my system... Oh, interesting. So GPG is not found. So let's go ahead and install that. This is one of the reasons why um, I became a big fan of sort of Linux in general because of the package management. And this is why I like to use a package manager on Windows because if I encounter a similar issue, it, the dependencies are generally taken care of. Okay, so I have GPG. All right, that took care of that part of the installation. Now we'll go ahead and run a sudo app update. And now the last step is sudo apt install zeek. So let's do that. So as you can see, one of the benefits of having a package manager is that all the dependencies that you need are installed here. Um, the reason why GPG wasn't installed automatically was that it was part of the command that I was running. Um, to look at the key that was involved with installation. So that was a dependency that, that's not really a dependency, it was a requirement for the, the command that I was running. Uh, without GPG being installed, I, I needed to remedy that somehow. So here we are, we can see various parts of Zeek getting installed. These are packages that are made by the, um, the Zeek project via OpenSUSE, so it's it's probably the best way in my opinion. Now, of course, you could install via, via um, source code. Uh, we'll save that for another day. I, probably someone else can work on that. I prefer using the package when, when at all possible because it just makes things uh, a lot easier. Um, you might be wondering, well, why can't I just do like an app get install Zeek? And it turns out that those packages aren't, um, well, first of all, they're very old in general. Um, they're backported and it's much better to use the packages that you get from the uh, the Zeek project as opposed to trying to get the Zeek packages um, from the Debian or Ubuntu or other similar projects. Okay, so here we are. Now, at this point, if I just try to run Zeek, you know, Zeek-H perhaps from the command line, um, nothing's going to happen or it's not going to work because uh, Zeek is not in my path. Um, what happens is um, Zeek gets installed into this opt Zeek directory. And in fact, the Zeek binary itself is in the opt Zeek bin directory. So I could choose to add this to my path. I'm just going to do it by hand here because it's not that big a deal for what I'm trying to do. Um, if I just do opt Zeek bin Zeek, you can see that that uh, Zeek is installed. Now, uh, I want to show why I installed uh, TCP dump. So I have uh, a loopback interface and I have a single interface. This is used for both administration and I also use it uh, for sniffing in this case. So um, if I want to, one of the things that you need to do in my opinion is whenever you're installing a, a type of network security monitoring tool, especially one that you're not familiar with, you want to make sure that it's seeing the traffic that you expect it to see um, and, and not blame a problem that you think the tool might be having on simply not having your interface uh, correctly configured. So to that end, I'm just going to show using TCP dump to make sure that I can actually see traffic on this interface. So yes, I'm seeing traffic and in fact what I'm seeing are the SSH packets between my local system and the um, virtual machine itself. And in, in fact, uh, this is, <laughs> this is a, a self-looking ice cream cone, actually, because for every packet that gets generated, uh, it generates another packet. Um, anyway, if you're monitoring an interface that is watching traffic that is showing up in a monitor, you're just going to keep generating more traffic. So this is just something I'm doing here to show that, yes, I am seeing traffic on, on that interface. And that'll give uh, Zeek something to work with. 
Um, now Zeke is not running at this point, so if I want to uh, do something with it, I have to configure it uh, in order to work. Okay, so we see the TCP dump is listening to traffic. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to capture some traffic so that later on when we're running Zeke in a forensic mode, like looking at a saved packet capture, it has something to look at. So that's going to require me to start up a uh, another tab here because I'm going to have one for capturing traffic and one for doing an action, and I need to turn that off. No, I do not want to save the password. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up TCP dump in this window, and I'm going to write it to a trace. And I'm going to tell it just to watch for TCP port 80. And then over here, I'm going to download a helpfully posted exe from the internet because that'll give Zeke something to chew on a little bit later. And I'm going to do that three times. All right, now we'll come back over here. And you'll see that I have now captured that. And if I were to take just a quick look at this, there's my traffic. There's my get request. So it looks like I'm pretty good. Now, I didn't check to see if I dropped any traffic here. Um, and that reminds me that it is very important to make sure your interface is, is set up properly to capture network traffic. Um, there's a couple of settings which are by default good for the operating system perhaps, but not good for packet capture. And that leads me to one of the most helpful posts you'll find on the internet. Um, posted here by our good friend Doug Burks from Security Onion. Um, actually, I think Doug wrote this. I don't know. Is there a name associated with it? Yeah, posted by Doug. So what is full packet capture, not full, pack full packet capture? And um, actually, Doug posted this when we were working together at Mandiant, I believe, or maybe right before he joined Mandiant. I'm not sure, but it was 2011. Um, so the thing that Doug makes clear here is that, and you'll, you'll encounter this sometimes, um, there's two issues you're going to encounter when, when capturing traffic with Zeek, um, especially, um, well, I don't know if it's especially with virtual machines, but I tend to encounter it more often with virtual machines. One of them is, is checksum offloading that will result in traffic that Zeek doesn't want to process. And the second one is some of these uh, interface characteristics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow Doug's advice uh, for using the ethtool command and I'm going to disable some of the more problematic um, uh, network interface parameters that could cause trouble for me capturing traffic. So I'm going to, I'll go ahead and do it in this window. And I'm going to preface it with a sudo. Actually, I may need to do that twice. Uh, you know what, let's just do this. All right. Oh, I need to put in the right interface name, which is ENP0S3. Okay, good. Now I'm going to repeat my um, my packet capture. I need to repeat the collection of it. There we go. And I'm going to repeat my downloads. All right. 
Now, this is interesting. If you recall, when I did the first capture, I had something on the order of 4,000 packets captured. This time, I had 6754. And if we just look at the files, yeah, take a look at the second capture is a decent size bigger than the other one. Um, and then maybe 30% larger. So it's possible we dropped a lot of traffic just then, just using TCP dump. Um, and all we did was we downloaded the same file three times. So this should bode well for when we're trying to use uh, Zeek in a moment. Now, in order to use Zeek, we have to make a couple changes to key configuration files in order for it to work properly. So I've made a couple notes about what those are. Um, the first one we need to edit is this opt share Zeek Sorry, opt Zeek, share Zeek, site local.zeek, which I'm sure it made sense at one point um, to put it there. But these days you just have to know where to find it, I suppose. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to make sure that we have a couple of things added that are required. So uh, we're going to uncomment that so it will load packages. We are going to enable a package for file extraction. And I haven't put the note in here, so I'll have to get it from my other set of notes. We are going to load frameworks. Files, extract, all files. And then we're also going to add in two components there. The first one, ignore checksums. That's another um, safeguard we're putting in to make sure Zeek doesn't care if the checksums that were offloaded by the NIC um, are different than what Zeek would compute for the packet or the TCP segment, I guess. Um, or maybe it would be the packet or the frame. Any, in any case, I always put this into my configuration files. And the second uh, change we're going to make is adding in this log ASCII use JSON. Um, I'm, now that the JSON format is out, I just think it's a lot easier for analysts to read. You don't have to know which column you're looking at in Zeek output, the tab separated value output that's the default. So by adding this in, it's just a little bit easier for mere mortals to read, I believe. Okay, we have to make uh, one other change, and that is to the opzeek etsy node config file. And really what we have to do is just tell um, Zeek what interface we're listening on. So ENP0S3 is our interface, and that's it. Now, with those two changes, uh, Zeek should be ready to run. Um, I'm going to run a couple commands to make sure that that is the, cake, uh, the case, though. I'm going to use that using um, Zeek control. So the first thing I do is, oh, I found an error. Op Zeek share Zeek site line 105 can't find packages. So let's see which problem that is. So it must have been this, what I loaded, frameworks, files, extract all files. Let's make sure that that is correct. It is frameworks, at load frameworks, files, extract all files. Huh, that's interesting. I think I found the error. Um, the issue I'm having is that I don't have any packages loaded here. So we're going to comment that out. Now, if I had loaded some packages using the uh, ZKG, the package manager for Zeek, then I would need to say load packages in order to use them. But I have not done that yet. And I, don't, I won't need that for that example. So I'm going to comment that out. And I'm going to run Z control check again. And it says it's OK. 
and we'll run deploy. And I think we're okay there. And then we'll run status. And Zeke is running. So that's great. So now it is watching the SSH traffic essentially that's coming to and out of or to and from that wireless interface. Um, in fact, if I were to let's see if I have this other I do have another window here. Let's take a look. Uh, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create yet another window just to look at uh, the logs. Okay, so I have a current directory currently. And you can see that uh, I've got some data there. Uh, so for example, here's some information from the SSH log. In fact, this is probably my most recent login. Um, this one right here. So that's working, that's good. So now what we're going to do is we are going to download our EXEs again. Get rid of the ones that are already there. And we'll see if Zeke notices them. So one. Two. Three. All right, and now we'll come over here and take a look at our logs. Ah, yes, now we have an HTTP.log. We have a files.log, and we have an extract files. So if we were to take a look at our HTTP.log, here we have our three requests. That's a good sign. Let's look at our files.log. We have our three requests. It says zero missing bytes. That is a good sign. And if we look in our extracted files directory, we see that we have three files. Now I'm going to, let's see, let's do this. All right, so we just did a uh, SHA-256 hash of each of these files and uh, yeah, there's no, there's an MD5 and there's a SHA-1. I could have just looked at those, uh, I suppose. I'm, I'm kind of conditioned to this point to use a SHA-256. Um, really, nobody should be using an MD5 or uh, probably even a SHA-1 at this point. So anyway, we have these three files, and these are the reconstructed files that Zeke pulled out of the HTTP traffic as it was observing it. Now, if I come over here and I look at my three files that were downloaded, I'm going to do that same um, SHA-256 sum against my three EXEs. And just check it out here. You look at this ECBE, all three are the same. I would hope that's the case because this was the, these were the files that were created by the download. And incidentally, you know, what are these things? Um, they are all uh, Windows executables, as you might expect with a .exe extension. So here we are, ECBE, and then we come over here, and these are the files that Zeek extracted and we see that they are all having the same uh, hash. So we've got Zeek running, it extracted files, and saved them to the hard drive. So that's all pretty cool. Now, uh, <laughs> at the risk of pointing out an issue that I currently don't understand what the problem is, I'm going to show you something and we'll see if this actually happens the way it did in my previous testing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop Zeke. And then I'm going to come over here and look again in my logs. Okay, there is nothing in current. Okay, nothing in current. Zeke creates a directory named for the day that it did the captures, um, September 30. Let's take a look there. 
and we have now uh, gzipped versions of our logs. So for example, if I did a um, zcat of the files, here are our three entries just as we expected. However, what has happened to my extracted files? Previously, they were in this extract files directory. Now they are gone. And I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> uh, if you take a look in the Zeke Slack channel, you'll see I was asking about this because I was doing the testing and I was, I was you know, starting Zeke, running my tests, downloading my files, uh, found my extracted files, and then afterwards they were gone. And as you can see, they, the same situation has occurred. So I, I'm going to try talking to the developers about this to see if perhaps there's some hidden behavior that I just don't know about. Um, but I may have discovered a bug that we need to fix. I don't, I really don't know. Um, but that's probably the beauty of doing this kind of testing is that without testing, you don't find these sorts of, of situations. Or if the, if the files are, are simply located elsewhere, it should be easier for me to find them. So for example, um, if I were to just do a search on that file name, I'm checking the whole hard drive now for that file, nothing. Um, I'm going to do a search for any file that has HTTP in the name. And you can see on the whole, the whole volume, the whole hard drive here, these are all of the files that simply have HTTP in the name. So uh, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to find these files if they're still there somewhere. Um, I'll just do, just in case, there might, they might somehow now be named by that, uh, that hash or, or UID. Nothing. Nothing. So they are well and gone as far as I can tell. Okay. Um, but we have a situation now where, where Zeke is working. And why don't I show one other uh, situation here? And that is going to be running Zeke against the uh, uh, the PCAP that I, I um, created. Now, we have to find the PCAP that we created originally. Um, we have two of them. Let's run against the second one first, because I think that's the one that's going to work for us. And we're going to run Zeek from the command line. And I'm going to make, uh, make a couple directories here. Um, we'll call this one 2021-0930B log, and we're going to change into that. And I'm going to tell Zeke to run against this PCAP. And I'm saying dash C will disable checksums, just like we had in the configuration file. And this redef will tell Zeke to use JSON, just like we did also in the configuration file. So we'll see what happens when we do this. All right, we'll do our ls. And we have, we have a files.log. And we have an http.log. We have a pe.log as well. But I don't have my extracted files. All right, in order to extract the files, I need to tell Zeke on the command line to invoke that particular script, which I didn't do here. So it did the, it did the work of identifying the files, but didn't extract them anywhere. So in order to fix that, let's try running this again, except I'm going to make a new directory for us. Okay, now I need to tell Zeke where to find that script. And that is here, opt Zeke, share Zeke, policy frameworks files, extract all files dot Zeke. So we're gonna add that into our command line. And now we'll see what logs we got. 
and check it out. We have an extract files directory. And there are those. And now let's get a hash of those files. And there you can see Zeek has extracted the files. They match the hash that we had of the original binaries. So what that tells us is that uh, Zeek was able to um, extract the files properly from the TCP dump. And the second TCP dump, the, the B version that we did, did capture all the traffic. Now for comparison's sake, let's make a directory for our first PCAP, the one where we had not uh, configured the system yet properly. And I'm going to run Zeek against that instead. And we'll see what happens. Okay. Now, this is going to be interesting. We have an extract files directory. Let's see what Zeke thought of the files it saw. So we have missing byte zero. Ah, it says no missing bytes. So that's a good sign. That's interesting. Let's uh, take a look at, actually, you know what? Let's um, Let's do our hashes. Huh, so there we go. So this is interesting. So even though those two uh, files, the two PCAPs were of different sizes, so let's take a look at that again. The, um, the difference must be in the contents, so what what traffic is in each one. So I, I suppose you know if we wanted to, we we'll actually might as well do a little bit of that. Let's uh, let's take a look at our log here, and let's just look at the con log. And we have the three transactions there. Let's look at our other one. And yeah, three three logs there as well. So we have a bit of a mystery here, I think, as to why those files are of a decent size difference, uh, and yet our con logs are basically the same, and the first file didn't drop any traffic either. So that's uh, as often what you find uh, when you're doing any type of, of network monitoring is you can encounter uh, new questions. So I hope, <laughs> at least in this presentation, that it was able to give you an idea of how to get started. Um, we showed how to get Zeek running in a virtual machine, how to grab the packages you needed, how to install them, how to then uh, configure your system ca to capture traffic properly. We captured uh, traffic using TCP dump, just so we have for comparison purposes later. Uh, we then configured Zeek. We ran Zeek against the management interface that was downloading three EXEs. We extracted those files. We also repeated that process against the save PCAP. So I hope this was helpful. If you have any comments, please feel free to leave them uh, via the Zeek mailing list or preferably in Slack because I'm more likely to see them there as well as other members of the project. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. And for now, uh, good luck with your network security monitoring.